Remember having the talk as a kid? Yes, that talk. The one about the birds and the bees. It was embarrassing and awkward, but also important. Our parents might have assumed the talk was just a one-time thing. Once we learned the basics, everything else would just fall into place. But the world is changing fast, and the questions are getting more complex. So let's go there and look with courage at sexuality and identity. It's time to move the conversation beyond the birds and the bees. All right. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Eaglebird Church. Thanks for being with us today. And if you're online, a welcome to you as well. We are starting a new series today called Beyond the Birds and the Bees. And if you're a parent, you know what the talk is like. You have the expectation that you're going to talk to your kids about the birds and the bees, how babies are made. And that's going to be awkward for you as the parent. It's going to be even more awkward for your son or daughter. But you sort of know what to expect. These days, we've gone beyond the birds and the bees. These days, as a parent, you might get questions like, well, am I a boy or am I a girl? Or am I neither one? You might get questions like, well, what if I was born a boy, but I feel like I should be a girl? We are officially beyond the birds and the bees. Last year, I was talking to a woman in our church, and she was telling me about her 15-year-old daughter. And she said, my 15-year-old daughter is struggling to know if she's binary or not. Non-binary means not male or female. Male, female are binary categories. Non-binary means something else, not that. But the way she worded this to me was she said, my 15-year-old daughter, like many 15-year-old girls, is struggling to know if she's binary or not. The phrase that stuck out to me was, like many 15-year-old girls. About three months later, I was talking to another volunteer in our church, and he had a 13-year-old daughter, and he estimated that in her class, about 25% to upwards of 50% of the girls were struggling with their sexual identity. And by struggling, what I mean is they weren't sure. They were confused. They were being bombarded by messages online. They were being taught things in school. They were having conversations with their friends and experiencing peer pressure, and they just didn't know what to believe. They weren't sure, am I a boy or am I a girl or am I something else? Should I be attracted to boys? Should I be attracted to girls? Should I be attracted to both? They weren't sure. A little bit after that, I met with a man in our church who reached out. He was dealing with some guilt and some shame in his life. And so I met with him and I found out he had been born a man, but then he had become a transgender woman. And then he had detransitioned back to becoming a man. And the guilt and shame that he was dealing with was due to things he had done as a transgender woman. Now, I share these stories with you because I want you to see the heart behind this series. The heart behind this series is not for us to take a stance. The heart behind this series is not politically driven. It's, we're not pushing an agenda of any sort. The heart behind this series is people, real people. Real people who attend this church, real people who God values and who God cares about, real people who we care about, people who need to find freedom and clarity in Jesus Christ. That's what this series is all about. Now, before I get into the main part of the message, I just want to set a couple ground rules with you. First ground rule is this. I don't have time to address every objection or situation. So about a year ago, I started studying this issue of gender identity. I knew I was going to need a whole year to read books, listen to podcasts, study articles, and really understand what it was that I was going to be talking about on this weekend. And as I got into that, I realized pretty quickly that in a 35-minute message, I was not going to be able to address every objection. And so there might be something in this message that you go, wait a minute, what about this? Or, or, or what about that? And I would say, yeah, I know, but I just don't have the space to address it. I also realized that everybody's situation and circumstances are different. And so what might relate to one person doesn't relate to anyone else. And so you might say, well, that, that's not my experience. And again, I would agree with you. So here's what we've done. We've put together a resource page 
put together a resource page that you can access on our website, eaglebrookchurch.com, and it has some of the best resources that I've found over the course of this past year. Here's the second ground rule that I want to set with you. It's okay if you disagree. We live in a culture right now that tends to think, well, if you disagree with me, then I don't want to have anything to do with you. I'm going to block you. I'm not going to listen to you. I don't want to spend time with you. And I don't think that's very healthy. If you're here today and you say, you know what? I'm not sure what I believe about Jesus. I'm not sure if I think that the Bible is my source of truth. I'm so glad that you're here. And even if you disagree with some of the things that you hear in today's message, it doesn't mean we can't love each other. It doesn't mean we can't be in a relationship with each other or attend church with each other. It's okay to disagree. Now, this cuts both ways. If there's something in this particular message that you agree with, for this message, I'm going to ask you not to clap at that point. Because what I've discovered is that people who are on the other side of the aisle, when that happens, they feel ostracized and unwelcomed. And I don't want that for them. Here's the third ground rule. Our approach is to speak the truth in love. So look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 4. Paul says, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head That is Christ. What he's saying here is that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He's the head of the body of Christ. And if we want to grow in maturity, if we want to become more like Jesus Christ, we will speak the truth in love. Here's what an immature Christian does. They speak the truth, but they don't do so in love. So they go, you know what, I'm just going to tell it like it is, and I don't care what you think or how you feel or if you're offended, I'm just speaking the truth. But their tone and their attitude is one that if you're on the other side of the aisle, you're not persuaded by them. You simply feel like, oh, you just, you don't love me or care for me at all. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Here's what the immature Christian does. The immature Christian loves people. And they're open, and they're inclusive, and they're compassionate, and they're loving. But in the course of being loving, they begin to compromise or disregard the truth. A mature Christian speaks the truth, but they do so in love. In John 1.14, here's how it describes Jesus. It says that he was full of truth and grace. He wasn't 50-50. He wasn't like half truth, half grace. He was 100% full of both. He wasn't 75-25. He, he didn't say, well, in, in, when in doubt, tip to truth or, or tip towards love. He was 100% truth and he was 100% grace. But this begs the question, what is truth? And we've done whole messages on that before, but for the sake of time, I just want to quote Jesus to you. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the what? I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is not found in an ideology or a philosophy. Truth is not found in politics or a politician. Truth is not found in cultural trends or what everyone else seems to believe. Truth is also not found in our own opinions and experiences. Truth is found in a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but when it comes to Jesus, I don't want to pick and choose. I don't want to say, yeah, Jesus, I know you predicted your death. I know you resurrected back to life. But when it comes to this kind of hot button controversial issue, I'm not going to pay too much attention to what you have to say. I don't want to do that. It's because I don't want... To conform God's word to my opinions, I want to conform my opinions to God's word. So here's what happens for a lot of us. We have our opinions that have been shaped through our own personal experiences or relationships. And then we take those opinions and go, okay, how can I get the Bible to support my opinions? So yeah, you know, this Greek word, it it could mean this. I mean, I don't know if it does, but I I heard someone say that it could mean this. So I'm going to use the Bible to support my opinion. 
I don't want to do that. To the best of my abilities, I want to come to the Bible and say, I want you to shape my opinions. We all have biases. We all have ways that we're going to look at things and see things differently. But to the best of my abilities, I want to conform my opinions to God's word. And I hope you do as well. Now, maybe you say, you know what? I don't know that I do. I don't know that's what my source of truth is. And I would say to you, okay, at least we know where we disagree, right? It's not that one person is more loving or one person's more accepting or more open. It's that we have a different view of where truth comes from. But as I mentioned earlier, this message isn't going to be just about truth. It's going to be about people. If you're here today and you're in the LGBTQ plus community, I would want you to know as, as I was preparing for this message, I met with many who identify that way, both in our church and outside of our church. And one of the things that I said to every one of them that I could was this, you are welcome in this church. Our church is not against you. Our church is for you. Our church wants God's very best for your life. I want God's very best for your life. And so you may not agree or relate to everything that's said in this message, but my hope is that you would hear our heart, that our heart is for you and that we love you and that we really truly are grateful to have you with us. All right, that's kind of the setup. Let me jump in. And here's the three main questions that I'm going to try to address in this message. The first question is this, what makes a biological male or female? The second question is, what does the Bible say about males and females? And the third question is, if you're a parent and your son or daughter comes home and says, you know, I think I might be transgender or I think I might be non-binary, what should you as a parent do about that? Talking predominantly about gender identity. Here's the first question that I want to address, which is this. What makes a biological male or female? This has actually become a question. Some of you might be like, well, that's obvious. But, but it's not to everyone these days, at least. There's a current question about when I look at a person and say, that's a man. Or when I look at someone and go, that's a woman. What do you mean when you say, that's a woman? This might surprise you, but within the scientific community among biologists, at least to the best of what I could discover, there's a consensus about that question. This isn't a question where they're like, wow, well, we're not really sure. There is a consensus as to what makes a male and what makes a female. There's three primary characteristics that distinguish males from females, and the first one is this, reproduction. So men and women have different ways of reproducing. They have different reproductive organs. The second one is external anatomy. Men and women have different body parts. They have different external anatomy. And the third one is a presence or absence of a Y chromosome. When it comes to science, the science is fairly consensus about this. It's reproduction, external anatomy, the presence or absence of a Y chromosome. If you tend to follow science, that's what the science says. But does that settle it? Well, not for everyone in our culture today. In fact, the question that's increasingly being asked is this. If a person has incongruence, in other words, if there's just something that's not lining up between their biological self and their internal sense of self, which one determines who they are? In other words, what I'm asking in this question is, if a person was born a biological male, but from a very young age they had this inner sense that they should be a female, which one trumps the other? Does their biological self trump their inner sense of self, or does their inner sense of self trump their biological sense of self? To be transgender means that you, in general, were born a male or female, but you want to be the opposite. You, you, you feel like you should be the opposite. Someone who's non-binary refers to someone who rejects those categories. They're like, I, I'm not going to fall for these two categories, male, female. I'm something else. This is why Facebook for a while had 71 options when it came to your gender identity. And finally, they just said, well, let's just do a custom one. So you could just customize what your gender identity is. I was talking to a bisexual male as I was preparing this message, and he said a phrase that really just caught my attention. 
He said it several different times. He said, the gender that the doctor assigned to you at birth. And the first time he said it, I pictured like the doctor like flipping a coin. Like, boy, girl, we'll go go with boy. But that's not what science says. Science doesn't say that the doctor assigns your birth. Science would say that the doctor identified your gender. They didn't assign you a gender at birth. They identified what your gender already was. And they identified that based on reproduction, external anatomy, and the presence or absence of a Y chromosome. Now let me just pause here for a moment because one of the questions we get a lot from parents They'll say this, well, what if my son or daughter seems to be really into stuff that is normally associated with the other sex? In other words, what do I do if my son is really into pink and princesses? Or or what do I do if my daughter wears her hat backwards, does not want to wear a dress, and is really into fantasy football? Does that mean that they're transgender? Does that mean that they're non-binary or that they should have a sex change? The answer is no. And the reason why I say I believe that the answer is no is because there is a difference between gender stereotypes, which are culturally constructed, and gender absolutes, which are biologically identified. There's a difference between a gender stereotype and a gender absolute. For example, in 1918... The Ladies' Home Journal wrote this. It said, pink, being a more decided and strong color, is more suitable for boys. While blue, which is more delicate and dainty, is prettier for a girl. Imagine that for a gender reveal party. (laughs) Pink is boy, blue is girl. Now what's happened? Since 1918, culturally, there's been a shift in gender stereotypes. My son, one of my sons, when he was three years old, we would watch a bunch of Disney princess movies, and we went to the dollar store, and he saw these princess figurines, and he's like, oh, I want those. And there was something in me as as a dad that was like, I don't know if I should be buying him those, but I thought, oh, you know, I'm just going to get, so I bought them for him. Now, a year later, he was into sports. What happened? Did his gender change? No, his interest did. If you're here today and you're a girl and you're going, you know what, I'm just, I don't want to wear a dress. I want to wear jeans and a hat and I like playing football and those kinds of things. That doesn't mean that you're transgender. Doesn't mean that you're non-binary. Doesn't mean that you need to have a sex change surgery. It simply means you don't follow stereotypes and there's nothing wrong with that. My real concern here is with parents who their 8-year-old, their 12-year-old, their 14-year-old shows signs of being interested in things that normally you would associate with the opposite sex. And based upon that, the parents decide to make a life-altering decision and to have a surgery that changes their child's gender. It's a massive misunderstanding of sex and sexual identity. Just because your son or daughter is interested in things that culturally are identified with the opposite sex, it does not mean that they're transgender or non-binary. In fact, in the Bible, King David wept and played the harp. Meanwhile, in the book of Judges, Deborah was leading the nation of Israel into battle with a sword, fighting people and cutting people down. My point is, gender stereotypes are culturally constructed. They are not biblically mandated. But when it comes to this issue of what makes a male or what makes a female, scientists are pretty clear. It's reproduction, external anatomy, and the presence or absence of a Y chromosome. Second question I want to ask is this. What does the Bible say about being male and female? So I don't, for me at least, I don't want to just look at what science says. I want to know, what does God's word say about this? And do they line up? Does God's word match up with what we're seeing as what scientists say about being a man or being a woman? Well, people will point out that Jesus never used the term transgender. And and he didn't. And so people will look at that and go, well, Jesus never even used the word. I mean, clearly the Bible doesn't have much to say about it. But the reason that Jesus never used the term transgender is because Jesus was Jewish. 
and he ministered to a predominantly Jewish audience. And within Judaism, this issue wasn't controversial. It was pretty settled. Now, I'm not saying there weren't people in the first century who were dealing with gender identity issues or who were desiring to be transgender. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is the Bible had spoken clearly about it, and it wasn't an issue of debate. Here's what the Bible says about this. It starts in Genesis chapter 1. It says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, human beings, male and female, he created them. So the Bible says that we are made in God's image. The Hebrew word here for image is teslem. And what it means, it's most often used to refer to an idol. An idol was a physical representation of an invisible God. So what he's saying here is that all these other gods have golden calves and other kinds of physical representations of the invisible God. But for the God of Israel, for the God of the Bible, his physical representation, what's made in his image is men and women. Men on their own do not encompass the image of God fully. Women on their own do not encompass the image of God fully, but together Men and women bear the image of God as male and female. Now you say, well, male and female, I mean, those are just human constructions. That's just some term or category that we came up with. It's just a psychological, social kind of construction. Well, if that's the case, then the next verse doesn't make any sense. Because in the next verse, he says, be fruitful and increase in number. Notice the progression of his argument. He's saying human beings are in the image of God. God created them male and female. And a part of being male and female is what? Reproduction, external anatomy, the presence or absence of a Y chromosome. Jesus picks this up in the New Testament. Jesus is speaking to a group of Pharisees about the issue of divorce. And he says this. He says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So according to Jesus, God created us male and female. According to Jesus, marriage is between a man and a woman and I just want to stress to you right now that those are not my words. I didn't like craft that in my office. Our leadership team didn't come up with that statement for our church. Those are the words of Jesus himself. If you're a follower of Christ, you have to wrestle with what he means when he says that. But I want to pause here for a moment and make an important distinction. The Bible never condemns transgender people. The focus is on behavior. And there is a difference. There is a difference between desiring something and acting upon that desire. You can have a desire for something, and that's not necessarily a sin. It might be a temptation, but it's not necessarily a sin. And so if you're here today and you identify as LGBTQ+, or you have attraction or feelings towards those things, if you have a desire for sex change or to be the opposite sex, that's not necessarily a sin. But I would also say this to you. Not all desires and feelings are meant to be acted upon. If I acted on every desire that I've ever had in my life, my life would be a mess. And there are parts of my life, there have been times in my life where I acted upon a desire that I shouldn't have, and it brought a mess to my life. It brought consequences to my life. Just because you have a desire to be the opposite sex or to have a sex change doesn't mean that you should do that. I was speaking to a woman recently, and she was telling me about her 12-year-old daughter who came home from camp. And her daughter said, you know, I, Mom, I think I heard from God for the first time in my life. And this mom was really excited. She was like, oh, sweetie, what, what, what did you hear God saying to you? And this little 12-year-old girl said, I felt like God was saying to me that I am beautiful and loved 
the way God created me to be. My hope and my prayer for every boy and girl, every man and woman, is that you would know that you are beautiful and that you are loved the way that God created you to be. It says in Psalm 139, David is speaking to God. He says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. And then he says this, I know that full well. Do you know that full well today? Do you know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made? Do you know that God knit you together in your mother's womb? Do you know that you are made in the image of God, male and female, and that God has a plan and a purpose for your life? Sometimes we try to take matters into our own hands. We say, yeah, God, I, I know what your creative intent and design was, but, but I, this is how I feel. This is what I want to do. And my prayer today is that we could trust in God's creative design over our life and that we would have peace in who God created us to be. Here's the third question I want to look at today, and it's this. What should a parent do if their child says that they are transgender or non-binary? Let's start here. Love your son. Love your daughter. Don't abandon them in the struggle. If anything, move closer to them. You may not agree with every belief or behavior in their life, but they should never doubt your love. They should never doubt your loyalty to them as their parent. Love them. Now, I do need to say that there is a difference between love and affirmation. And I need to say that because increasingly I'll hear people say, well, if you love me, then you'll affirm me. In other words, you'll affirm every belief or behavior that I have. And while love and affirmation are related, they're not the same thing. And I think I can prove this to you. If your daughter came home, or your son, and they said, I feel fat. I'm going to go on this really unhealthy, restrictive diet. I'm going to starve myself to death because I feel fat. What would you do as the parent? Well, you would love your daughter. You would love your son. You would probably love them even more. But you would not affirm their feeling. You would not agree with that feeling or say that's a, that's a feeling that you should follow after. It's because love and affirmation are related, but they're not the same. It is possible. My point here is, is that it is possible to love someone and also not affirm every behavior or belief. We all do this. It is possible to be radically inclusive towards a person, but not to be radically inclusive towards beliefs or behaviors, especially ones that go against God's creative design. Let me share a few statistics with you. And just so you know, as I've dug into all the studies that have been done on this topic, what I've found is you can find a study to back up your position. I mean, you can cherry pick these things. You can find any study that will back up what you already believe. And so what I tried to do was to look for peer-reviewed studies that had been kind of bantered around within the psychological community. Here's, to the best of my abilities, here's the best studies that I found. The studies show that young people who transition to a different sex, are at a higher risk of depression, suicide, and psychological disorder after they transition. Now, there are other studies that say, no, 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 it's the opposite. If they don't transition, they're at a higher risk. But most of those studies, there's question marks about those. The best studies, for my opinion, will show that those who transition are at a higher risk of depression, suicide, and psychological disorder. The studies also show that if young people are given some time to work these issues out on their own, that in a healthy environment, they will often come to the conclusion that they are their biological gender. Now, what should this teach us? Well, I believe it should teach us that let's not make a life-altering decision for a young person before their brain is even fully formed. So here's what's happening increasingly in our culture. All of a sudden, a son or daughter comes home and says to their parent, I think I might be transgender. I think I might be non-binary. 
And in some cases, the parent could see this coming. In other cases, it's completely out of the blue. And they dig into it and find that they were taught something at school or they got involved in something online or with a friend group. And so the parents don't know what to do. And so they take their son or their daughter to a counselor or a health professional. And the counselor or health professional will look at them and go, well, you better have a sex change surgery or put your kid on puberty blockers or they're at a high risk of suicide. That is medically irresponsible and doesn't follow all the data at all. Puberty blockers can have an adverse risk on a person's blood pressure. They increase your risk of blood clots, heart attack, stroke, and cancer. They can lead to diabetes. If you're on them for two years or more, you most likely will be infertile. Now, here's the question I want to ask. Is there anything else in life that contains those sorts of risks for a young person that we would advise them to do or we would say, well, you should do this. Only a person more committed to their agenda than they are loving that person would say to do that. As I read through some of these stories, the thought that kept popping in my head was, can we just let kids be kids? Can we just let kids not have to figure everything out in life by the age of 14? Can we stop pushing our adult political agendas into a kid's life and not make a life-altering decision before their brain is even fully formed? As I close, I want to speak to two groups. First group I want to speak to is those of you who would say, I identify as LGBTQ+. And again, I just want to say to you, I'm so thankful that you're here, that you're viewing this message. But you might be thinking to yourself right now, you know, you, you say you love me, you say I'm welcome, but then at the same time you say that God created us male and female. And, and my gender is my core identity. It, it's who I am. It, it's how I identify. And so I don't feel very loved. I don't feel very welcomed. I want to try to address that for a moment. And I want to address it by asking this question, who are you? At the deepest part of your being, what is your core identity? For example, all of us are wearing a shirt right now, and on the back of that shirt is a label. And for some of us, the label says Gap or Guess, and for others of us, it says Nike, Under Armour, Adidas. But here's the question, who gets to label that shirt? Well, the maker does, right? The maker is the one who has the right to label the shirt. Who has the right to label you? Is it other people? Is it what other people think about you? What other people say about you? Is it, do they have the right to label you? Is it our culture and cultural trends? Is it politics or politicians? Is it ourselves? Do we get to say, well, hey, it's my life. Yeah, I get to label myself. Or is it our maker who has the right to label us? I believe that our maker is the only one who has the right to label us, that our core identity as people is not our sexuality. It's deeper than that. Our core identity as human beings is we are a child of God. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that is your core identity. It's who you are. You are a follower of Christ. You are a child of God. And so my hope and prayer is that maybe not overnight, but over the course of time, beliefs and behaviors would begin to align up with your core identity. If you're here today and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of confusion around my gender, my gender identity. I have all these questions and I just don't know what to do. I want you to know that our church would love to walk alongside you in that. If that's something that you would want, we would love to be able to do that. We would love for one of our pastors to be able to meet with you. You can send an email to our Contact Us page on our website. And we're not going to like push an agenda on you. We're going to listen to you, love you, help you, walk with you through this season of life. We would love to be able to do that with you. Here's the second group I want to speak to today. The second group is those of you who say, you know what? I agree with most of what you're saying. I, I agree that God created us male and female. And I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for being a part of this church and for standing for biblical truth. In our culture today, with all the pressures and everything that you hear, that is, that's, that's not as common as you would think it is, and I'm just so proud of you. But I don't know if you're the way I am, but when I hear messages like this, here, here's what can happen in my own heart and my own spirit. I can get angry. 
And I start hearing these stories, and this is what's happened to kids. And all of a sudden, I start to get really angry about that. And I've had to remind myself of this verse. It's God's kindness that leads to repentance. I have never argued someone into the kingdom of God. I have never yelled someone into becoming a Christian. I have never posted about a hot button social media topic on social media and had people go, oh my, yes, tell me more about Jesus. I myself have never gotten a a direct message or, or an email that was angry in its tone and thought, oh, I wanna be more like you. Tell me more. Just, just have never done it. It's because it's God's kindness that leads to repentance. It's God's kindness that leads to life change. There might be someone sitting next to you in your work, at your school, in your church, and they don't know what to believe. They have thoughts that they don't necessarily want to have. They have feelings that they don't want to have. They're struggling with their own gender identity. And if all they hear is us railing against this, because it's become a political sort of issue, they're not going to come and talk to us. They're going to go talk to someone else. Yes, there's a time for righteous anger. Yes, speak the truth. But the question I want to ask us today is, is there someone we could show kindness to? Is there someone who's on the other aisle, the other end of the aisle, that we could show deep love and kindness to this week? Because the world will never hear our truth if our grace is not felt. Before I pray for us, I just want to let you know, next week we're going to talk about healthy sexuality. We live in a world where healthy sexuality is hard to find. It's, most of us have not had a picture of what that looks like. God created sex. It was, sex was God's idea. It was a gift from God. But sex has become so distorted that it's become an issue of pain for many of us. And so we're going to talk about what does healthy sexuality look like. That's next week. Let's pray together. Lord, there may be someone here today who this is more than just like, oh, this is what I believe about that, but this is personal to their life. God, minister to them right now. Surround them with your love. Speak your truth. God, I pray that you would begin to work in their heart and in their mind to align their core identity with their beliefs and their behavior. And God, for some of us, it's a struggle. For some of us, it's it's a battle. And God, I pray that you would encourage us to let them know that you are not done with them, that you are love them, that you are for them, God. That they can walk this with you and not without you. God, for others of us, there might be someone in our life who we know about or don't know about who's dealing with this, who's, who's trying to figure these things out, God. And I pray that you would use us to speak truth and love to be a mature follower of Jesus Christ, not to compromise the truth, not to disregard the truth, but to genuinely love people and to genuinely care about people and to show your kindness to them, God. We're gonna need supernatural strength to do that at times. And so God, I pray that you would give that to us in our life. God, I thank you that you are a God who created us fearfully and wonderfully, that you knit us together in our mother's womb. Lord, I pray that we can trust and find peace in your creative design. I pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you need prayer for anything at all, come on down front. We'd love to pray for you. Otherwise, we'll see you next weekend.